heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Father God, we come to hear a word from you. For if we don't hear from you, Jesus, what shall we do? So this morning, oh God, we pray that you will send us a word. Send us a word that will challenge us. Send us a word that will change us. Send us a word that will convict our hearts. Above all, we pray that you will send us a word from the very throne room of power. We wait now in expectancy to hear from you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let the people of God say. <clears throat> I'm so happy and delighted to be here this morning to speak a word on God's behalf. Let me thank Sister Rita, the pastor and the leadership for having me speak a word from the sacred desk today. This is the day. I believe that this is the day that the Lord has made. And as people of God, we must rejoice and be glad in it. This week was a very, very, very challenging week for me. And uh, came home to me even more vividly, that, that hymn that says the Sabbath, the joy of the Sabbath. It brings repose from labor. And it tells of joy divine. Understand that not too long from now, we will soon not have this privilege, this freedom of worship that we now experience. For we've got to keep in the forefront of our minds that the enemy has openly declared war against the people of God. And we must fight. Are you listening to me this morning? And I know this is youth's day. That is why the Bible says, young man, I call upon you because you are strong. Young people, you are to remember your creator in the days of your youth. God is depending on the young people to finish this work. Ellen White says, army of young people, rightfully trained. That means that the church has a responsibility to train our young people to take a stand for Jesus and to finish this work. Since we are in warfare, the church ought to be in a posture of worship and war. Make no mistake about it, church. These are serious times. These are times which prophets of old wished they were alive to see. These are indeed prophetic times. Times where we are now seeing the prophecies which we would have studied and learned being fulfilled before our very eyes. These are the times where we will be tested. These are the times where your faith must be solidified in God. This is not the time to be iffy and second guessing be very sure 
the songwriter says, you've got to be very sure that your anchor holds and grips the solid rock, Christ Jesus. Listen to me this morning, man. God is right now, God is in the business of sealing his people for this final crisis which is upon us. And very soon, he will no longer wait on those of us who have been playing church. God right now is assembling his army for this grand showdown against the forces of evil. And he has not only called us to be soldiers in this army, he has equipped us with the necessary tools needed to be victorious in this fight. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they are what? Mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. So if, 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 if you are not serious about this, I'm sorry to say, but this is not for you. This is reserved for folks who are locked in with God. And by experience and conversion are motivated to do only what God empowers them to do. Brethren, this is not about lip service, brethren. Are you listening to me this morning? As we've come to a time where people like to hear a good sermon. and The Bible predicted that. Heirs of the word. And we don't back that up with any action. We like to talk a good talk. Listen to me this morning. Be not deceived into thinking it is merely okay to speak the content of the gospel. That's not enough. For the content of the gospel is mere information. Spoken gospel is powerless without the accompanying lived experience of the believer. So all this lip service and all this talking, time has come where you've got to practice what you preach. Are you listening to me this morning? That's like you, you, you telling people to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy and and every Sabbath you, you, you come to church and you talk your own stuff and some folk go as far as even promoting their business and all kinds of madness on God's holy day. You, you know what that is called? That's what you call hypocrisy, brethren. Saying one thing and you're doing another. And, and you are just you fit right in the category of what Jesus calls lukewarm Christians. And God cannot tolerate such individuals. What did he say about lukewarm Christians? I wish you were hot or cold because you're neither hot nor cold. I will spew you out do you understand the language that the bible is using in other words i will vomit you out what does that mean have you ever vomited that's when you your stomach cannot absorb or digest that which you have consumed and you have to get rid of it you, you can't tolerate it god says i will spew you out God can't deal with those type of people, brethren. And so he counsels us this morning, buy of me. Gold tried in the fire. 
so that you can be purified with the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Let me thank my dear brother for reading, for so ably reading our passage of scripture this morning. And I will be using that passage to assist with setting the context of our message today. Matthew, turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3. Jesus in conversation, in dialogue with his disciples, which they came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answered them and said, What did he say unto them? Come on, you got to talk to me this morning. What did Jesus say to the disciples? Take heed that what? No man deceive you. For what? Come on, talk to me, church. And what? And what? Come on, list them out. For these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences. And shall what? Kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for... Shall arise and shall deceive many. Verse 12. Come on church. Let's read the word. And because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall. And verse 13. Let's zoom in on verse 13. But what? And this verse. Verse 13. That's where I want to focus this morning. This stands to reason. Pastor. That as the battle between good and evil intensifies, many professed Christians, many who would have been coming to church week after week, many who even would have held positions and gone through the motions of church activities will drop out along the way. But the Bible says, what did Jesus say? He that endureth unto the end. The same shall be saved. I want to read a word in your hearing from the book of Psalms. The 11th chapter. This is where I'll be focusing this morning. The 11th chapter. The psalmist. Let me give you the context of this psalm. The society had failed. Saul had made a fool of the name of God. The spiritual foundations of the nation were shaken. The political landmarks were corrupted by greed, avarice, Pride and open rebellion. The family structure was broken. There was no law and order. David, the psalmist, was on the run for his life. For there seemed to be no break from this constant barragement of evil. So here we find David in Psalms chapter 11 in counsel with his closest friends. In the Lord put all my trust. How do you say to my soul 
Flee as a bird to your mountain. For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string. That they may secretly shoot at the upright in heart. You've got to understand the language here. The shooting at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? I want to pause here at this inquiry, preacher. For we are living in a time of crumbling foundations. And that's the topic of the sermon today, a time of crumbling foundations. Jesus in Matthew 24 predicted that we would have come to a time such as this. Arthur Cleveland Cox captures this perfectly when he penned the hymn, We are living, we are dwelling in a grand and awful time, in an age on ages telling to be living is sublime. We ought to be very, very aware of the subtleties of the enemy. For the record is the wiles of the devil. And if you do not know the form of his attacks, then you will not know how to mount a response. Many of us are under spiritual attack and we have no knowledge of it. And our lives are being steadily destroyed for my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. There is a very, very strange but secret weapon of the enemy for those who will walk godly for Christ. We can spot the attack when it comes from the enemy. And more often than not, especially in these last days with all the madness that's taking place even in our church, some of us will begin to question God and question even the very faith to which we have come to believe. In these last days, the devil will use even those closest to us who will do stuff that will cause us not to necessarily abandon the fight, but to become discouraged and to doubt the mission and even the power that attends you. And ultimately, that doubt leads to lack of faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. You've got to understand the warfare tactics of the enemy. These were David's closest friends. Folks in whom he confided. Folks who were supposed to be engaged in the war against evil. Telling him to flee as a bird to the mountains. But why was this advice being given to David? Well... They tell us the society was in shambles, Elder Stoddard. Justice abandoned the throne. King who was supposed to be priest and king was now on a murdering mission. And there the boundaries of Morality and spirituality were removed. And here comes the great inquiry this morning. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Oftentimes we who are called by God, we who embrace the faith that we live and see life through a window of hope until God allows something to happen 
that buffets the reality of our time and that window narrows to a slit and you now have to excavate or find a reason to fight during a time where your faith is being tested for faith can often mean the difference between victory and defeat if the foundations be destroyed what can the righteous do that word foundation in the hebrew means the reason or purpose for used to be preacher when i was growing up in the church and we heard these texts thinking that these foundations were firm immovable irrefutable truths but over the years as the battle intensifies between good and evil slowly and systematically we have seen where the devil has been chipping away at these foundations of morality these foundations of spirituality these foundations of hope and here comes the great inquiry this morning if they be removed if they be destroyed what can the righteous do These are indeed unprecedented times, times of crumbling foundations. What can the righteous do? What can we do to stay this tide of crumbling foundations? What can we do to keep our anchors rooted, and grounded amidst the tide? of confusion, faithlessness, and wickedness. What must we do? We live in a time where we find ourselves questioning, is this still God's remnant church? Our spiritual foundations have been shaken. We have been attacked by the enemy, the devil seems to be having a grand time in our churches. We no longer are seen as people of the word, for we have been compromising the very word of God. We buy Bibles, but we don't read them. We sing Psalms, but we don't believe them. We come to church, but we don't really know who our God is. Our worship experiences have become weak. The word of God has been trampled on and church has been reduced to mere socialization and entertainment with little or no substance coming from our pulpits. And every week we go through the motions of church activities with no real connectivity. And I hear the psalmist asking the question this morning, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Listen to me this morning. We have lost our way as a church. Spiritual things of God have been placed on the back burner. Things which God has instituted to keep us on the straight and narrow. The very foundational principles upon which this church was built. The very reason for which we exist. We have willfully neglected those principles, those precepts, those foundational principles that are needed to shape and guide our lives as Seventh-day Adventists. We have slowly turned away from them and our lives are occupied chasing the things of this world, leaving us with no time for family worship, no time for Bible study, no time for prayer and fasting, 
No time to be locked in with God. Earnestly praying for the latter rain and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is needed in these last days. And here comes the great inquiry. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? What are we supposed to do, brethren? These times, that which owes a safety and sanity and spirituality of our community at bay are being destroyed. If they be removed, if we remove them, what can the righteous do? Not long ago, there was a time where it used to be a foundation, a firm principle that a family is made up the way God designed it to be in the book of Genesis. Slowly, we have shifted from that foundational principle and now every man does what is right in their own eyes. The divorce rate amongst us is alarming. And now we see it fit to celebrate certain lifestyles and certain behaviors. And this thing has caused a huge debate in our church, preacher. I was at the park the other day and getting ready to play a match and one man turned up without his gears saying he doesn't know which woman's house he left it and the brother thought that was cool preacher this is the kind of stuff that is celebrated in society and I had to confront that brother and speak a word and let him know this kind of stuff ought not to be celebrated. And he must change and turn from that wicked ways and repent. We've got to speak a word in these times. And over the years, we have chipped away at that foundation, the family unit which is the foundational pillar of every society. And I hear the psalmist asking the question this morning, if the family foundation is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Living in a world where our children must sit in classes at grade three and be taught that it is okay to go against the law of nature and the set principles of the Bible. Brethren, do you understand what's happening in this day and age? If the foundations be destroyed, what must the righteous do? These days we have drifted so far. Now we've gone to the extent of recreating ourselves. When God has already declared us to be fearfully and wonderfully made. For man is still the crowning act of God's creation. And it was after the creation of man that God declared that everything that he God had made. Behold it was good. Don't you understand? Listen to me this morning. Do you not understand that when you alter God's creation, you are insulting the creative genius of God? That's like a slap in the face of God, disrespecting God, and God is going to hold us accountable, brethren. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? 
used to be. Our teachers would remind us of God. Speaking to our souls truths that were consistent with moral servitude. Now our teachers are sleeping with our students. Abusing them in all ways. We live in a world where you are rewarded for your craftiness with evil. We live in an era where might is right. And he who owns the biggest gun takes the biggest share at the expense of human life. You saw that with COVID. If the foundations are destroyed, new life, what can the righteous do? Doc, I was listening to the Family Life program you had the other day here. Speaking about the challenges of the black man. Our justice system has been skewed. And this madness is a, it is a psychological disorder for a judge to sentence you based on the melanin content of your skin and not the clearly defined rules of law. Our young men are dying mercilessly in the streets. And our women are left to raise families by themselves. And the statistics reveal that 85% of our boys will be victims of the system. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? But this is the pivotal question of our time. And it demands a response for the right from the righteous. I said it demands a response from the righteous. For it is the duty of every believer, every blood washed believer, to confront structures of evil and to destroy them in the name of Jesus. We must mount a response. For if we remain passive in the face of evil, if we remain silent in these times of crumbling foundations, then we are not of God. Our society is plagued by an epidemic of immorality. Folks are choosing to commit suicide, going to bed with pills and Waking up to stay awake with pills and checking in with psychic networks and checking in with psychiatrists and nobody comes to church because church has lost its relevance. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Used to be, as a boy growing up in the church, church was locked in with God. I remember days when we had all night prayer and fasting, prayer warriors, men and women whose knees bore testament that they have been with God. Fasting and praying for issues affecting the church, fasting and Praying for spiritual guidance, fasting, and praying for the community in which they were positioned for every church still as a responsibility to its community. And if you are not fulfilling the mandate of God within your community, you are a menace to society. These days we hardly, if any at all, do these things, preacher. Hence the reason why our church has become so chaotic, confused, paralyzed, cannot discern the voice of God for direction and vision. And without vision, the people perish. These foundations be destroyed. If they be destroyed. What must we do? 
What can we do to stay this tide? Well, I submit to you three things the righteous can do. You've got to understand that this is a war, brethren. This is war. And when you are in war, you, 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 you've got to be ready. You've got to be in war, warfare mode. You've got to suit up. Preacher, you, you, you're, a, you're a soldier and you, you know what time it is. You've got to suit up. I believe the Apostle Paul gave the proper response in the book of Ephesians. Turn your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. What did Paul say? Reading from verse 11, Paul says, Put on the whole armor of God. This is war, brethren. Got to suit up. Put on the whole armor of God, he says, that you may be what? Be able to do what? Stand against the wiles of the devil. For what? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Against what? Against what? Rulers of the darkness. Against what? Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the what? And your feet shod what? With the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of what? Wherewith ye shall be. Come on, church. Listen, man. You don't sound like you're in war, brethren. And take the what? Helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is what? Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching with all perseverance and supplication. Brethren, this is war. And you've got to suit up. Suit up. You better suit up and take your stand for Jesus. Too many of us have not yet suited up. We have become so comfortable with the encroachment of evil on our territory. And the devil has stolen a march on God's church. These last days, God is looking for men and women who will stand up and speak a word. This is the mandate that God has given us. And this is the mandate that we will follow. Suit up and join the fight. And as people of God, we don't back down from any fight, brethren. Because the fight is just a formality when victory is already secured. You better suit up. In the name of Jesus, you better suit up. For a weapon formed against the people of God shall prosper. Suit up. For greater is he that is within you than he that is within the world. Put on the whole armor of Prince Emmanuel. Sound the battle cry and let them know that sin is still sin. Righteousness is still righteousness. And wrongs are still wrongs. And we are not afraid to call sin by its rightful name. Suit up for Jesus. Better suit up, man. Better suit up. Tell them. They need to repent and come out of her, my people, because Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great nation, for she made all nations drink of the wine of her fornication. Tell them that there is still a God in Israel and his word still applies to this apostate generation. Suit up. You've got to suit up got to blow the trumpet blow it trust the watchman blow it over land and sea God's commission sound a message every captive may be free you've got to fight suit up for Jesus church cannot sit passively and be disengaged from this fight 
we must fight. Must fight and let men and women know that Jesus is merciful and Jesus can save. Got to suit up, Virgin. Suit up and join the fight. Pity a church that is not suited up in battle array. Pity the church that sits and watch men and women dying in sin. Pity the church that does not take a stand against apostasy. Pity the church that has no ministries to reach the broken and the abused. Pity the church that is not engaged in active evangelism, bringing a word of comfort to the marginalized. You've got to suit up. For pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. And to keep yourself unspotted from the world. Listen to me this morning church. You cannot afford to be disengaged from this fight. You better suit up. In battle array. And take your stand for Jesus. Second thing the church must do, got to subscribe to truth. John 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the what? I am the way, <clears throat> truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father. But by me, listen to me this morning, when you encounter Jesus, who is the truth, you cannot remain the same. Transformation must happen. That's what truth does. That's the power of truth. It causes you to think. It causes you to become different. It frees you from the oppression of sin and sets you on the path of righteousness. A couple lessons ago, we studied about the reformers. And one of the great reformers one of the greatest champions that ever fought for the cause of truth in a time of apostasy was a man called Martin Luther. Luther was a truth bearer. He was zealous. Listen to me this morning. Anyone who decides to join this fight and finish the work, you must be zealous. He was ardent and devoted, knowing no fear, no fear of man, no fear of system, no fear of government, no fear of church board and church leaders, but only the fear of God and acknowledging the Bible and the Bible only. Sola Scriptura, Sola Scriptura, the Bible and the Bible only. Listen to me this morning, church. Just like Luther, sometimes standing for truth will require you to stand alone. And what will be the result? Friends will turn from you. Family members will turn from you. Have you not read? Even brother will turn against brother. Father, their sons. But I remember Jeremiah when he stood up for truth and preached the word of God. I remember he could not take it anymore. I remember he lost friends and lost country and lost nationality I remember when he was left alone and beaten constantly and one day they kicked him and threw him in a mud pit and he cried out oh God how could you he had experienced the effect the action and the result of truth he said I'm done I'm done but as he said I'm done his blood began to boil his heart began to pump he said I cannot remain silent in the face of adversity his brain began to fire he said I can't keep silent for the word of God is like fire shut up within my bones that's the power and effect of truth this is war brethren when you decide to stand for truth you will have to do just like Jeremiah did this conflict is an irrepressible conflict. 
We cannot remain quiet. We must face it head on, brethren. We must fight. We must contend. We must contend for the faith that was once delivered. Some of you don't want to put no energy in this fight. And in some churches, you got folks who they put their energy fighting against their brothers and sisters and fight for church positions and through their actions stifle and sabotage the advancement of the gospel. Shame on you. Shame on you. Listen to me this morning. I told you Martin Luther was a man for his time. Luther fearlessly attacked systems and structures of evil. Too long we have been sitting down. And now error has crept in and taken over. Too long we have been sitting down and watching people in error who don't know the truth perish in evil. Like Luther, we must attack. We must attack and call sin by its rightful name. In the game of football, the coaches will tell you that the best form of defense is attack. You better attack. Tell them that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, brethren. You've got to attack. These times of crumbling foundations, you cannot remain silent. You've got to subscribe to truth and speak a word for Jesus. The last thing that you must do is you've got to stand. I said you've got to stand. You've got to stand. This war between good and evil is going to intensify, but you've got to stand. Jesus said it in Matthew 24. He that endure to the end, same shall be saved. Listen to me this morning. You better get some backbone, otherwise you will be nothing more than a church goer. And if the only thing you've got to offer to God is just going to church, you are not doing nothing for Jesus. You've got to be willing to die for this gospel, brethren. Got to know whom you believed. You've got to be resolute, steadfast in your faithfulness to God. That no matter how the foundations are crumbling, you will still stand. And having done all, stand, you've got to stand. Stand like a brave with your face to the foe. Stand, for it is not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord God Almighty. Stand, for he who is with you is greater than he that is against you. Stand knowing that your help cometh from the Lord. You better learn how to stand even like the three Hebrew boys on the plains of Dura. We will not bow. Even if our God does not deliver us, we still will not bow. Stand for one of these days, church. God is going to put an end to all of this madness. Stand and be counted for Jesus. Stand and not be bought or sold. Stand and be fearless in calling sin by its rightful name. Stand for the right though the heavens fall. Stand and be true and honest. Stand though the tempest rages and the billows roll. Stand though the enemy throws his fiery darts at you. Stand like Job and declare devil. Though ye slay me, yet will I trust him. Stand like Job and declare, I know my redeemer lives. Yes, some of us may lose our lives in this fight. But rest assured, once we remain faithful, we shall 
I said, we shall, we shall, we shall overcome one day. Deep in my heart, I do believe, I said, I do believe, we shall, we shall, we shall see him, see him in all his glory, see him in all his majesty, see him in all his splendor, and when we see him, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let an angel prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem, and we shall crown him, crown him, crown him, crown him, Lord of Lord. Listen to me, church. This war is just a formality because victory is already secured. You asked me, what can the righteous do? Listen to me this morning. You better stand. Stand. Stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross. Lift I his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory. This army he shall lead. Till every foe is vanquished and Christ, I said and Christ, and Christ, I said and Christ is Lord indeed. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. Got to stand. You've got to stand, brethren. Yes, it's going to get rough. Yes, it's going to get tough. Yes, we are going to lose our lives. But we've got to stand. Got to stand. If you want to make it, you're going to lose friends and lose family. You may even lose possessions, lose everything. But what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? You've got to stand. For Jesus. One of the most curious texts that I've ever read in the Bible. Is a text that says, and in that day. Many shall come to him saying, Lord. Lord. Did we not? Do you think that, that, that thing troubled me preacher did we not cast out demons my, my father told me of an experience he had casting out demons and, and that was no fairy tale business did we not cast out demons people who cast out demons I'm assuming are church folks brethren that's not some folk who, who is in a at the bar or at parties. Church folk coming to Jesus in that day. Did we not? Means that you can be in church all your life and still lose your soul. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 13, He that endureth to the end Brethren, this is war. And you better get in the habit of, you better get down on your knees and wrestle with Jesus. This is war. And the devil is not going to ease up. He's coming full force. And that's why you've got to suit up. Right? The apostle Paul says in Ephesians, this is warfare, brethren. Jesus is coming again. And he's coming for a people who are spotless and are ready. That is why Paul could have said at the end of his journey, I fought a good fight. That, that, that's, that, that's the place where we are to be as Christians. If it should come down to us losing our, losing our lives. I fought a good fight, preacher. Done my part. And there's a crown awaiting me in glory. You can kill me all you want. 
got to get serious about our soul salvation, brethren. This is serious business. This is no joke business. I think I've said enough. The word has gone forth this morning. The Spirit of God has spoken to your heart. And, and, and you want to take a stand in the army of Jesus. You've been coming to church and, and you're not so sure where you are. You're here, but your mind is not here. Here in body, but your spirit is not here. Playing in the river on the bank. And you want to say, Lord, I want to turn it over this morning. I want to suit up. I want to stand up for truth. I want to stand and let people know that sin is still sin and righteousness is still righteousness. You want to stand on the side of Jesus. I'm going to ask you to come. I'm going to ask the pastor to come this morning. If you are here this morning, even if you want to get, but never been baptized in the church, or you've once walked with God, and you have somehow drifted far away from God, it's time to come back. And take your position in the army of God. God is calling you this morning. Is there one for Jesus this morning? You've been coming to church 20, 30, 40 years. And by the way, listen to me. It doesn't even matter if your name is on the church record. The only thing that matters is if your name is written up there in glory. You can come to church all you want. If transformation does not take place, you are wasting your time. Yes, sir. You would have wasted 30 years of your life. Is there one for Jesus this morning? Preacher, I'm going to ask you to come. Is there one for Jesus this morning? Oh, I'm coming home.